The 5th edition Dragonlance book has turned out to be less a setting book and more of an adventure book with some setting data, which is fine, but in an attempt to make up the difference, I recently purchased a few Dragonlance books written by fans from the DM's Guild. In this post, I'm reviewing Tasselhoff's Pouches of Everything. This book, tragically currently only available as a PDF, at least at the time of this review. It requires gold status for DM's Guild to offer it as a hardcover, which I hope it will achieve. It's written by the Dragonlance Nexus community, which is a community around a website that's been an invaluable source for Dragonlance news and lore since forever, basically since the late 90s in some form or another. I like to think that I'm familiar with Dragonlance personally, having read all the Dragonlance books I have ever stumbled upon over the years, but this community, th th these are the experts. They, they wrote this book. There's too much in this book for me to cover in a review, which I think is a good sign, but I'm going to start with a, w at the beginning and, and then cover some of my favorite points. Ancestries of Ancelon. The Shadow of the Dragon Queen book acknowledges basically two races of Kryn, Kinder, and Draconians, and really only the kinder out of those two are playable. There's a paragraph or two confirming that gnomes and elves exist, and then another paragraph about how all the other races could find their ways to Kryn too. But anyone who's read even just the first Dragonlance Chronicles trilogy knows that there's a lot more to Kryn than, than just the core races. There are 20 pages for Kryn races in this book, and for each race there's an overview of lore, and sub-races. So the dwarf section, for instance, doesn't just mention that dwarves exist on Kryn, it talks about Kalnar, Hylar, Dargar, Darwar, Klar, Nidar, Thywar, Zakar, and yes, Agar. The Agar are the gully dwarves, which I actually mentioned in a previous video how they weren't in Dragonlance this time around. The, the book includes lore and options for humans, elves, gnomes, tarmac, minotaurs, another race that, that really should be in a Dragonlance setting book, Irda, Phaethon, ogres, a, a couple of different varieties of ogres, but most importantly for me is this book's version of the Kender. I understand the arguments for reducing Dragonlance down to something simple for casual players, but the Kinder is, aside from the Draconian, the defining race of the setting. To an outside observer, though, I understand this, a Kinder probably looks just like another halfling. But then again, you look at a hobbit and it just looks like a generic halfling. But no one would ever argue that the hobbit didn't define Middle-earth. The same is true for the kinder, I think. It's the, the little details that sets them apart from just any other halfling. The kinder in the official 5e book, for their racial traits, gain advantage on saving throws to avoid the frightened condition. You gain proficiency with your choice of either insight, investigation, sleight of hand, stealth, or survival, and you get a combat ability where you can taunt people. In Tasselhoff's Pouches of Everything, you get an ability increase, your charisma score goes up by one. You have kinder weapon training, you're proficient with improvised weapons. You double your proficiency bonus when you make an intelligence history check regarding geography to, to reflect the kinder's love of maps. You gain a couple of languages to reflect that kinders often travel. And as a wanderlust kinder, you also gain a dexterity score increase by two. You are immune to the frightened condition because kinder are immune to fear. And you have kinder pockets. In a pinch, you may pull a random item out of your bag or another container. As a bonus action, you can reach into a container you're carrying and roll on the kinder pockets table to determine what item you've pulled out. And in combat, you have the ability to taunt people. This is the kinder that I want to play when I go into Dragonlance. This is exactly the kind of kinder you see in the books. Classes. Despite its title, Chapter 2 is full of subclass options, not classes, and they're all pretty great. Well, I mean, they all look great. I haven't playtested them at the time of this recording, but what I really like about them is the context that the authors provide. That These aren't just flavorfully named subclasses. These are subclasses with foundations in lore. The authors describe why the subclass exists, when in Kryn's history it was common, and in some cases, what it has become after the cataclysm changes everything. But the classes pale in comparison, in my opinion, to the other component of this chapter, factions. Factions are, are very optional. I've used them before as a dungeon master, both in Path 
Pathfinder and in Dungeons and Dragons, and whether they actually become a driving force in a campaign usually depends on both player buy-in and the forgetful Dungeon Master's ability to continue to make them relevant during the, the game. One of the reasons I enjoy Ravnica so much is the focus it places on factions, or guilds in Ravnican terminology. I find factions to be an easy hook into world building and lore, and while their upkeep can mean additional work for everyone, the added political aspect and world building is a lot of fun. In Dragonlands, like Ravnica, there are hugely important factions built into the setting. That's probably an understatement. Dragonlance is largely defined by Ancelon's factions. The most obvious two probably are the Knights of Salamnia and the Wizards or Mages of High Sorcery, but there's also clerics of various gods. There's King Priests, Seekers, uh, Dark Knights, the Legion of Steel. The faction sections of Chapter 2 covers all of the most important ones, the, basically the ones that I mentioned, although do they have Seekers? I'm, I'm not, I can't remember. And it goes a step further than just listing them. It provides ranks within each faction, so you can keep them relevant in your game world by using the optional renown rules from the DMG. Lunar Magic. One of the factions is the Wizards of High Sorcery, and this book casually implements a simple but effective Lunar Magic system, similar actually to my Lunar Magic system, which I covered in a separate video. You can go check that out. It, this isn't surprising that mine is basically the same as theirs and vice versa. We're both re-implementing the original AD&D system. It, it doesn't make the Lunar system over complex though, and it provides a moon tracking chart to help you keep track of the phases of each moon. It is very similar to the original. It's a great tool. I think it offers a lot of variety into gameplay. In the official 5e Dragonlance book, of course, there is technically something called Lunar Magic, but it's awkwardly bound to the Sorcerer class, and it doesn't really reflect the fact that Kryn has three moons that affect magic. It's just a cool spell list swap mechanic. It's a nice nod to Dragonlance, but I think it's questionable as to whether it's really Dragonlance. Magic items. There are magic items in Chapter 7. Items include the Blue Crystal Staff, which you'll know just if you've just read even the first couple of chapters of the first book. The Staff of Magus, again, you'll know that. The Bright Blade. An assortment of Dragonlances. It's not all the iconic items from the Dragonlance books, but it's a bunch of the major ones. I probably don't have time to, to go through all of the backgrounds, the feats, including Kit's Grin, one of my favorites, Bestiary, the, the discussion of Kryn's timeline, the overview of the geography and key regions of Ancelon, including a great map. There's so much in this book, and it's all right. A at first glance, you might think that some of the content from the official source book is re-implemented here in this one, but this is mostly because they're sharing the same source. In some cases, this book's implementation of something is superior, in my opinion, to the official one, and in other cases, this book just builds upon the official version. So, for instance, all races are better here than in the official book, in my opinion. However, the Draconians here are basically the same as the official ones, except they're at a higher CR. So it looks like you're getting the same thing, but you're actually getting a stronger version of it. This is great for any dungeon master who knows that once your party gets very, very powerful, then those Draconians just aren't going to pose as much of a problem. You can throw more Draconians at them, bring in a dragon if you need to, but sometimes it's just nice to have some powerful foot soldiers to still be a threat. Oh, and there's also a 10-page first-level adventure included in the back of the book. So not only do you get the setting book, but you get a little starter adventure as well. I'm enjoying Shadow of the Dragon Queen a lot, and I think anyone who is into Dungeons & Dragons and hadn't heard of Dragonlance before Shadow of the Dragon Queen, I think that gives them a great taste of Kryn. But there's no question, if you're a fan of Dragonlance, then this is the 5e Dragonlance setting book you need for your game. And I think that's all I had to say about it, so thanks for watching.